Hello and welcome to Talk Tech. I'm Kristen White and speaking with me today is Will Price, CEO of Widgetbox. So can you define widget? Uh, many people are familiar with this term, but it can sure. have a very broad definition. Sure. Well, I think the Wikipedia example is like it's a portable chunk of application code is sure. the kind of the technical term. And really the way I think about it is like it's a, it's a component typically served up in an iframe that allows you to port and take with you um, something you've discovered on the web and consume it in a place of your choosing. So in some sense, it's the separation of the location of consumption from the origin of source. Uh, and historically, the one way to do that was to do programmatically through APIs, and so developers could call and invoke each other's services across the web. But for the average user, that was very difficult to do. Right. And so a lot, a lot of what happened was a lot of companies like Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, AOL, others built very complex APIs f and very powerful APIs for developers to leverage, but uh, it cut off the rest of the world. And so widgets, in many ways, are the lowest common denominator that allow anyone who can, can use a web page to configure a service, instantiate it in a piece of code that they can take with them, and then consume it where they want. One of the things that the web widget companies do is they provide the tooling for developers to actually turn services into widgets, but also very importantly, they provide the abstraction solution so you, you just build your widget and we'll handle all the integration for you. So we'll get you into the various endpoints without you having to worry about those specific APIs. And then we'll allow reporting for you to be able to know where on the web your services are being consumed, your widgets are being consumed, where are you getting users most quickly, what have I you. I see. So the developer comes to your site, and you have tools on your site to help the developer with Exactly. That. So we have tools right now. So you can come with, you can bring us a Swift file. If it's Flash, you can use JavaScript, HTML, what have you, RSS. Okay. Uh, so any piece of content you have out there can be turned into a widget. Uh, you can then list the widget in our gallery. So right now we have about 30,000 developers. Uh, who've created about 46,000 widgets. Those 46,000 widgets have then been pulled by users, as I said about the fragmentations, incredible, to over 360,000 different do domains. Oh, wow. Where Facebook and MySpace is just a single domain. Sure. And um, right now we're serving up around you know, 13 to 15 million widgets per day. So what's the incentive for developers to use your site? I know you mentioned the distribution, and that right. seems desirable. But right. is there anything else, that potential sharing ad revenue? or? Yeah, exactly. So I'll give you an example on the distribution side. First of all, we just had a guy build a Sudoku widget, and he listed it in Bebo's gallery and Facebook's gallery and in our, in our gallery. And okay. uh, within a week, he had 1.7 times more subscribers through us than he did oh, on I Facebook, see. and he had over four times more subscribers through us than he did on Bebo. So what those sites are really good for are the mega hit widgets, like the Super Poke or the Slideshow widget. But sure. if, if you are not someone who can command, you know, I think there's something like 20,000 applications on Facebook now. If you're not the top 100, you're going to get lost in the noise. Right. So what we allow you to do is by submitting a widget to our gallery, it's all SEO enabled, so we'll give you good natural search ranking. You can, people can find your widget much more easily. We can promote it both on our, on, our, on our site and within the gallery listings that are relevant topically to what your widget has. Right. We are in the process of introducing um, models where developers can start making money on the footprint that they're creating, uh, essentially. So those are some things we'll be rolling out in the next probably eight to ten weeks, but ultimately right now widgets have typically been driven by self-expression or kind of utility independent of commercial value and the next wave of the widget market will be definitely trying to understand what the economic value of a widget is, right. how that value gets shared between the developer of the widget, the platform that syndicates it, and the publisher that sh serves the widget onto its page. So what, cu what currently is your company's monetization strategy? Well, typically, if you think about most web businesses, they kind of have three. So for us, for example, we have a list. Uh, we have a gallery, and so there's a listings model in our gallery, which is that uh, people can uh, and will be able to pay for placement in the gallery. So if you have a widget um, that you want to get in front of a lot of people looking for finance products, we'll have a finance section of our gallery. You can pay for listings there. The, the second thing is that distribution. So right now, uh, widgets. Are the model that's c working for a lot of other companies right now is a cost per install model where you're looking for um, essentially subscribers to the widget. Right. And the reason you want to do that is you think that someone choosing to subscribe to your widget is an expression of intent or interest in your product. Okay. Similarly, that someone did a Google search for Toyota Camrys in Sunnyvale, they're expressing interest and intent. If you install a widget for an upcoming movie that's coming out or um, an eBay auction or some real estate listings, you're ex similarly expressing intent that you have an interest in this area. Uh, and, um, and lastly, the last one, so the first one is kind of directory listings, the second one is 
uh, cost per install and driving subscriptions of widgets. Right. And the last one is really in widget advertising. So people are experimenting that sure. with that as well. So how do you compete with Google and Yahoo? I noticed they have similar similar widget type sites where users can find and sure. create widgets. Well, it's hard to do that. I mean, they're two really big and very successful companies. <laughs> Yahoo's widget gallery is desktop widgets. They're not web widgets at okay, this point. Sure. So that's the first thing. And so it's basically based on the old confabulator technology. They're su it's a great looking gallery. They have maybe a tenth of the widgets that we have, and they're okay. all desktop-related sure. widgets. So Google Gadgets is, you know, Google Gadgets is a great, um, I think, indicator for us. One of the things I think of is if you last year, uh, eMarketer estimated the total widget market was like twenty million dollars. So one of the things that to me I think is most interesting is rather than worry about it being zero sum, like someone's going to take more of the market than me. At this point, I just really want to make sure that the market develops. So tell me a little more about your background and your career path. And sure. you've been involved in a variety of other star startups as well as the VC world. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I, I have a kind of a peripatetic career. I did a lot of different things. So I started, I, I, my, most recently I was a managing director at Hummer Winblad and was there for three years. Hummer Winblad is a, is a really great early stage software investor and um, Mitchell Kurtzman, who's one of the senior partners there. And, and I, we seed funded Widget Box uh, in April of 2006, so two okay. years ago roughly. And so I was there for about uh, three years. Before that, I was I worked at a hedge fund called Pequot Capital, which uh, kind of got me in my first job in kind of the asset management investment business. And I got to Pequot by doing my prior startup, which was basically they funded a company that acquired the company I had started okay. and ran. And so it was really serendipity that got me into the venture business. It was a great six years. I, I learned so much about how companies should or shouldn't be run, sure. uh, how to raise money, how to deal with investors, um, kind of so many best practices about um, just seeing people do things really but well or really poorly. You kind of learn uh, how to do things. Any advice to our viewers on kind of navigating a successful career path? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think. Um, the most important thing, I think, is recognizing that risk can come in all forms and shapes. I remember a lot of people feel like startups are very risky because sure. you know the capital balance may not last. And and but th I really believe that it's a fallacy that large companies are safer. And then I think on the you know in terms of venture capital, you know, people ask me all the time like how do you become a venture capitalist? And right. I, I basically have observed that the people who try the hardest have the hardest time getting in. <laughs> Because it, it's going to happen organically, and sure. by just being in around startups, mm -hmm. uh, getting great startup experience, um, being observed and watched for a period of time by venture capitalists who see you in action, so you're not being interviewed like right. tell me about yourself, but they go, "Wow, that guy is amazing! Look what they he just did." They want you for your track record. And yeah, your and they and they've able to watch and observe you over a, a year or two period, and so I guess one of the lessons there is you got to work for venture-backed companies. Of course. <laughs> so coming from the VC perspective, your background, yeah. um, what are the top three key things you look for in a startup um, as indicators for success? You want to have a team of very passionate people who are doing the business for the right reasons. Right. They are not interested purely in making money, but they're interested in solving a problem. And they would probably do it even if they didn't get paid to do it. And then you want to understand the team element too. It's like, right. so who are they surrounded around themselves? Are these people who are well aligned? Do they have a history of working together, or at least do they have history of competence in the space they're going right. after? And the last one I think is really important, which is kind of the, just the servable or the addressable market. You know, are they serving a market that's 50 million that's growing at 1%? Are they serving a market that's 50 million that's growing at 300%? Right. <laughs> and as I said before, you know, good markets, uh, you know, Mar Warren Buffett likes to say the market bats last. And so you can do everything perfect, and if the market doesn't show up, you'll, you'll be in <laughs> yeah. real trouble. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed talking with you today. Thank you. Thanks very <laughs> thanks much. Thanks for having me. Cool. And thanks for watching Talk Tech.